course by Dr. Malachi Andrews on Melanin, a special children's festival featuring the children from the Ravenswood City School District, a keynote address by Eugene E. White. A lack of a concrete culture that gives us identity, purpose, and direction. Let's look at the job question. People say we need jobs, but is that all we need? And if we had jobs, would we go to them? <laughs> People say we need money, and yet Although we make over $50 billion, what do we spend it on? One third of it goes to clothes. The rest, I assume, is spent on Cadillac. <laughs> now, if a people have $50 billion and spends a third of it on clothes, you got to raise the question, why? Why in the world would blood spend 30 a third, 33 and a third of his money and her money on clothes. Identity problem. A question of who I am. Blood walking around, funny style, fat, big hats, red, white, and blue, orange pants, <laughs> six and seven inch heel shoes. Blood is saying something to the world. No. I ain't much where. No, I don't have no education. No, I ain't gonna never control this country, but ain't I bad and loud? <laughs> that might be funny now, but on the street, it's a very serious thing. The clothes we wear wouldn't put us in nowhere but a circus in somebody else's, uh, other culture. Look at this, no other people in the world buy the kind of clothes we buy. Listen to that. If Jimmy Carter wore the kind of clothes that blood do, nobody in the world would take him seriously. Have you looked at what we seen with ourselves? Have you looked at what is really the problem with what we're doing? And I say it's a value question, a value crisis, that we don't have the right priority, we don't have the right commitment, and we therefore can't have the right possibility. After all, when I say we need a new culture, I'm talking about a need for a new system of views and values that give us a, a moral, material, and meaningful interpretation of life, and that at the same time demands our allegiance and a corresponding practice. What are values anyhow? Values are three things. One, they're categories of commitment. That's what are you dedicated to? What do you feel good about investing your life and action and thought in? That's what values tell you. Second, values are categories of priority. They're not only what you are dedicated to, what you invest in, they're also what you put first in your life. Third, then, values are not only what you are committed to, what you put as priority, they're also categories of possibilities, i.e., what your future is. Because what a person is committed to, what they put first in their life, dictates their human possibility. People that have more records than they got books and are dancing their lives away can't have too many possibilities. People that spend 33 and a third percent of their money on funny style clothes can't have too many possibilities. People that put more emphasis on their genitals and stomach than they do on education and building a future in their own image, shaping the world according to their own interests and understanding can't have too many possibilities. And you can give them all you want. You can give them the best schools that tear them up. You can give them the best neighborhood and they'll tear them up. And you can give them all kinds of leadership and they'll deny it. Because in fact, they don't have the right values, not the right emphasis, not the right priorities. How in the world then can we expect them to have the right possibilities? In the 60s, I said, we don't have a national culture. I stand by that. A lot of nationalists don't want me to say that, but i say it again. I said that what we got is a popular culture. 
not a national culture. That's why we don't act like a nation, because we don't have a national culture. We don't have a system of views and values that weld us together like a people, that makes us think collective. We have a popular culture. What is the difference between a national and a popular culture? Popular culture is the fluid, everyday thought and practice of a people simply responding to their environment. There's some things you're going to do anyhow, like eat, go to the restroom, things like that. Bop in your walk. You know what I mean? You're going to do that if you were in Soviet Russia. You're going to bop. You see what I mean? You're going to dance and sing and try to make, make something out of that. You ever know blood? Well, we bad singing. You're going to do that in him. But does that make you a people? No. Does that give you the strength to fight against our oppressor? To end his control over our lives and begin to take control of our own destiny daily life? It does not. Fluid culture is like the music you hear now. Every day it's a new tune you can bob to and forget what's really happening in the world. Do the tunes speak to us as a people? Of course not. But look at national culture. National culture, unlike popular pop culture, is not just a simple reaction to daily necessities and environmental conditions. National culture is a collective thought and practice through which a people builds itself, constructs itself, celebrates itself, and introduces itself to history and humanity. Let me say this again slowly. National culture is a collective thought and practice through which a people constructs and celebrates itself and introduces itself to history and humanity. You see, when we self-consciously create products that build us, that celebrate us, then people understand us in those terms. That's how the world sees us. When we self-consciously set up a holiday say like Kwanzaa and say, look, I don't care whether you like it or not, we celebrate it. I wouldn't care if your mama or papa celebrate it. We're going to celebrate it. We don't have to go and petition the legislature to let you uh, 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 put down this as a national holiday. We do it, and it's done. That's this is how this is how we introduce ourselves to the world. Not singing and dancing to please an indifferent world, but demonstrating to the world that we have the capacity to create progress. We have the capacity to shape the world in our own image, to raise above the earth images that identify us. Look at this, a national culture. Everybody, his mother and father, wants to identify with King Tut. Why you think so? Because King Tut represents a culture, a culture that constructed itself in beautiful image, a culture that raised images like the pyramid above the earth by which people could identify and say, look at the great things they have done. When we ask ourselves, about Afro-Americans, what have we done that, 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 that we can say is worthy of lining up with the rest of the world? What do we say about ourselves? And I tell you this, that our national culture gives us that kind of capacity to introduce ourselves to the world. It gives us the capacity to make history. You see, a lot of times people think that history is a very foreign, isolated process. But we make history every day. History is a very human thing. We bring it into being with our own hands and mind with what we do and do not do. When we don't come to school, when we fail, when we spend 33 and a third percent of our budget on clothes, that's history. The only thing about this is we have no control over how our lives go. We have no control over the direction and content of our lives. We just reacting. We just surviving. 
That's another characteristic of popular culture as opposed to national culture. The popular culture is a survival culture. Blood, how you doing? Just trying to get by. People putting people on the moon, building new machines, tearing down whole tropical forests, and the blood is doing what? Just trying to get by. <laughs> Why do you think blood is just trying to get by? Because there's no national culture to give him priority to do anything else. I said that in the 60s, I said now, the, the battle we're fighting now is a battle to win the hearts and minds of our people, and if we lose that battle, we can't hope to win any other. In the 60s, we had an ideological struggle between, between us and the Panthers. The Panthers used to argue the arms struggle. They said, pick up the gun. You got to get the gun. We said, look, as for guns, we can get them anywhere. Off the enemy's bodies. What is important is for the people themselves to decide that struggle was necessary, and then they would determine the method they're going about it. What is important is that we break the monopoly that the oppressor has on our mind so that we can dare struggle. You see, until the oppressor's monopoly on our minds is broken, liberation is not only impossible, it's unthinkable. Because you wouldn't even have the categories to think with. How in the world are you going to think a revolution and taking power over this country when you've never even controlled your own life? When your family is in disarray? When, in fact, you can't even control your block? They're getting ready to tear your street up, man, even told you. We got to be honest. But we, hear what we say, we're too busy to deal with that. I'm trying to survive, baby. Well, look, we always say this, I'll tell you this. Survival ain't the most important thing. The cockroach has survived longer than any other creeping, crawling thing. But at what level of life? Other people's homes, waiting for crumbs to fall off the floor. See, let's be honest. That kind of stuff is nothing anymore. You don't justify low standards. One of the problems we have in a popular culture situation is that, in fact, our standards have become so low, anything goes now. I'm going to tell you now, if you just survive, if you just get through America, people say, good. I don't say that. I say you can do more. We come from a great people. We don't just have to stargaze at the Egyptians all the time. We can duplicate and surpass what they did. Yeah. The whole purpose of my lecture is to ask you, can you dare greatness? Are you always watching and reading somebody else's history? Are you willing to make your own? You know, your history determines your humanity. How much history you got, that's how human you are. People don't recognize people that don't have no history. Animals have no history because they can't write and can't make it. But humans are determined by how much history they have. What have you done to contribute to the advancement of humanity? And you start advancing humanity by advancing the humans among whom you live. See, none of that liberal talk I'm working for the world. <laughs> That's a lie. Ain't nobody working for the world. That's why it's in chaos. See, the reason people claim they're working for humanity in the world is the world ain't got no structure to check them. I can say I'm for humanity, but where does humanity live? What language does it speak? What country does it live in? There's no such thing as humanity except a collection of the diverse cultures and people and make it up. Humanity then is nothing but a construction for the convenience of conversation. Without the people that make it up, it doesn't even exist, does it? <laughs> Those people are irresponsible people that put humanity before the very humans to whom they owe their existence. We all our existence to black folk. That's where we start. It's a silly and sly and unprincipled person that claim they can't do nothing for blacks because they're really human. <laughs> that, is, that is on no sheet, no identification document for travel or otherwise in the world. Nobody asks you, are you human? 
But if you shaky about it and got to keep saying it, they'll wonder. <laughs> a national culture then saves you that embarrassment. A national culture, a consciously constructed pattern of thought and behavior makes you know who you are. You can tell again how we don't have a national culture, but a popular culture by all the names we call ourselves. We the only people in the universe that got 50 different names for ourselves. But we are African with a K, African with a C, Afro-American, Amer-Afro, Ethiopian, Bilal ain't up here of late. When will it stop? <laughs> who are we going to give credit to? After a while, who do we, when we finally write our books and we get straight, <laughs> and we, <laughs> and we look and see how many people lay claim to what we do, we won't have much left. <laughs> We've got to be honest. The reason we have the crisis is there's no national culture to tell us exactly who we are. So we debate it. Look at it the way it is. Now, every culture, every national culture has at least seven aspects to it. First, it has a mythology. That is a religion or spiritual system. Don't have to be spookism, but a lot of times it turn up to be that. <laughs> Second, it has a history. Third, it has a social organization. Fourth, it has an economic organization. Fifth, it has a political organization. Sixth, it has a creative motif that produces art, music, literature, and technology. And finally, it has an ethos, a collective self-concept as a result of achievement on the other level. Now, what we want to do is go through those seven things and see how we as a people stock up. And if you understand what's happening on these seven levels, you can understand then the problem we have. Look at it now. First of all, every people has a mythology, a view of the universe and how they fit in it. They have a value system, a spiritual value system. And by spiritual, let me make a distinction here between spiritualism and spookism. The mythology can have both spookism and spiritualism. Spookism is an, Im an intense uh, emotional appreciation for unseen forces that dominate, dominate our lives and substitute folk, folk, pardon me, fake power for our own human capacity. That is to say it's a system that teaches us to deny our own human capacity and pray to and bow to things we cannot see and have no evidence of. Spiritualism, on the other hand, is an intense emotional appreciation for the highest values of humankind. Love, sharing, cooperation, collective work and responsibility, creativity. These are spiritual values. Nothing spooky, nothing on the moon, nothing halfway around the sun. Things that you need just to get along with your own family. How in the world you gonna work out things with your mother and father and you done turn your life over to somebody not even here? <laughs> and look at here. If we have a value system, a religious value system, and religion I'm going to define quickly as all those things that deal with ultimate concerns in life, thought and practice that deals with ultimate concerns in life, like where am I, who am I, why am I here, what's my purpose in life? When you ask those questions, spooks in the sky can't answer them. You've got to answer them. You are here to make our life beautiful. You are here to raise images upon the earth that speak to you, that strengthen you, that announce your existence to history and humanity. What else do you need to be here for? <laughs> See, let's be honest. But look at us. When we're not praying to a guy that looks like our oppressor, we are talking astrology. <laughs> Anything but facing life. It's no accident that astrology right now 
And, I, you know, we're going to have a question and answer period. You can raise questions to me about this. God know this is touchy at home. Look. It's no accident that astrology has all of a sudden become so popular. Why wasn't it popular in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s? You see, in fact, you can tell how bad people are living and how much hell they're catching by what they're willing to believe in. If I don't have no grasp of my life, if I can't determine what's going to happen to me from the next moment, if my woman is acting funny and, 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 and everything around me seems to be topsy-turvy, you can sell me in this hat win, air sandwich, and I buy it. Astrology is nothing but another air sandwich sold to a desperate people. People don't want to study each other and say, what's your sign? Here, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is a contradiction in naturalism. You know what I mean? I'm a naturalist of blood saying, you walk in there, I love my people. All right, now, how in the world are you going to tell me, Mike, you love your people? Then you walk up to a sister and say, what's your sign? And sister say, Captain, you say, oh, that don't even agree with me. You know what I mean? Look how asinine this is. Look how asinine this is. Interpretations of what happened to Jonestown. Jonestown happened in the context of mythology, in the context of spookism, in the context of organized religion that pimps people and take from them what they should be using for themselves. Let me give a quick rundown on Jonestown to show you what I mean. You know black people don't commit suicide on the humble, do they? You can't keep saying, look, here's what we, we like, a lot of times we like to say, well, the niggas just went on and follow white men. See, you know that ain't real. I'm going to tell you why that ain't real in a minute. You can't dismiss your people and attack them just like everybody else does. You, if somebody sold you that ass sandwich, I'm going to show you you went for it too if you were in similar circumstances. Let me tell you, I know you don't believe it, but I'm going to speak the truth. All right? Jonestown came because of two things. One, the pressure that society puts on people. The way it interrupts their lives, redefines who they are, leaves them lonely and looking for something outside of themselves. Religion then steps in to a very vulnerable people, gives them a fake cosmic purpose, and then takes them to the bus stop. Listen to what I said now. 
If you're going to understand Jonestown, you got to see it in the context of a society that so alienates the people and a religion that so pimps the people that they are ready for anything. In order to understand Jonestown, you have to get beyond at least five basic myths that the media taught us in order to hide the real significance of it. These myths are this, number one, that in fact this is a bizarre and strange kind of thing that doesn't ordinarily happen. In fact, suicides are happening right now. In fact, religion throughout its history has driven people to mass murder and mass suicide. In the early 70s AD, the Jews killed 900 of their people. The soldiers, the men killed, them, killed the women and children and then cut their own heads off, stabbed themselves. 1660s. Still in organized religion, spookism I'm talking about. The old Russian were upset by the changes in the, in the Russian Orthodox Church, and then they began to kill themselves because they couldn't accept it. First they fasted themselves to death, and when that didn't go fast enough, they locked themselves up in a building and burned themselves by the thousands. Then again, look at the Catholic Church, burning women at stakes, talking about their witches. Burning them by the thousands. And they talk about Jones. It has already been laid. The history of this kind of activity has already been laid down. So in fact, Jonestown is not so bizarre and unheard of. Yeah, it's anti-human. Yeah, it's a, it's a denial of people's right to live and build their lives in their own image. But in fact, Christianity already laid the basis for this. <laughs> but the media don't want us to believe that. That's why it takes us to the next myth that you got to get through if you're going to understand Jonestown. The second myth is that Jones, the white guy, <coughs> Jones was sick and so was his followers. You know, you hear people say that. Them people must have been really sick. <laughs> well, let's talk. Remember, I'm still talking on this out. I'm still talking on religion. I'm still talking on the fact that we don't have a national religion or a national spiritual value system to get us around this. Keep in mind that the myth is that the Jonestown people were just sick. So was Jones. But in fact, Jimmy Carter White, Senator Humphrey, Walter Mondale, Mayor Mastoni, Bradley, Diamond, the rest of them gave Jones credentials to even get in Guyana. Yeah. If they didn't have a kind of credential, then they would have got in Guyana. So Jones was all right until he did something they couldn't deal with. <laughs> and what about the black people that everybody jumps to attack just because the white people are attacking? Look at us going along with that. There were some sick people. What made them sick? Are they doing anything that's outside of what you do every day? Let's hear and see. It seems to me that and then, then the people said they were just lower class people frustrated, didn't know what to do. Now, see, that contradicts what they say about Joan. Joan had them because they were making money, people say. Now, look, why did they make money off all these lower class? What are they? I mean, just hit me real quick and I'll back off. Now, either they lower class or they getting them social security checks. These are older people. They are not prone toward abstract actions. They no disco fans, no tight pocketless pants wearing people. They ain't wearing their skirts up to their navel. These are serious minded black folks. Honest black folks. That's what makes them so vulnerable. Don't attack our people because it's the common thing to say. Third myth you got to get through and all this, keep in mind, this is spookism I'm talking. All right? Third myth is this. Here's a bunch of niggas following another white man. Well, look, all the Christians I know follow a white man. <laughs> And all the Catholics I know follow three. Jesus, the Pope, and the parish priest. And swear bomb. And besides, Christianity is supposed to be above racial considerations. 
why now interpret Jonestown in racial terms? Again, self-hatred, attacking your own people without seeing the social conditions that drove them to that and how organized religion, organized spookism made, took advantage of their vulnerability and took them to the bus stop. And let's look at the fourth myth. This is the one among the activists, you know. They say that this was a conspiracy of genocide against black folks. Most of y'all have said that. It's so easy. You know why the blood always talks genocide and conspiracy? Because the blood don't have no control over his life. Something's always happening to us. <laughs> so we figure somebody's always doing something to us. Look at this. If this was an attempt at Jewish genocide, you have to raise the question, why did the U.S. go to this extent? And if they went to this extent, would the Russians have gone along with it? Usually the reason people say the, the blacks were killed, you know, is because they were talking socialism and on their way to Russia. Isn't it? Wouldn't that be so easy if that was the way it was? Look, first of all, you assume that Russia would have taken them. Russia has proved that it'll sell out anybody for its own interests, just like Cuba during the missile crisis. When the United States told Cuba, told the Russians to take the missiles out, they took them out, regardless of poor Cuba. Also, you remember the Russians turned the money back Jones gave them. You know why? Because that's the way the big fellows play. All this little minor stuff, that don't mean nothing to them. Second, if it was a conspiracy to commit genocide, then you're assuming that the CIA thought 